Okay, hello, this is Mr. Weber, and you are watching video lecture number 33, uh, The Rise of Popular Politics. We're going to be looking specifically at the years 1820 to 1828. We have uh, four sections to cover today. Uh, the first is the decline of the notables and the rise of parties. Then the election of 1824, uh, the last notable president, John Quincy Adams. And lastly, the democracy and the election of 1828. So the American Revolution marked the beginning of a long-term breakdown of classical republicanism uh, in which the common folk recognized their natural superiors and deferred to their better judgment. By the end of the 1820s, this traditional pattern of deference to ruling elites had been upset by the advent of universal adult white male suffrage. The expansion of economic opportunities in commerce and manufacturing and also the social and geographic mobility of the people. In an egalitarian democracy, quantity rather than quality counted. Therefore, majority rule was almost irresistible. In such a situation where the whole mass of a people are authorized to exercise unexampled power, the Massachusetts reformer Horace Mann explained uh, it was essential that they be fortified with unexampled wisdom and rectitude. Otherwise, we shall perish by the very instruments prepared for our happiness. For James Fenimore Cooper, that happiness depended on a proper appreciation of social station. In the meantime, the economic expansion of the nation raised a host of new political issues. While many Americans continued to fear special privilege and the use of government to further private interests, uh, others, such as Henry Clay, began to argue that government aid to economic development, such as the use of tariffs to raise the prices of foreign imports in competition with um, American manufacturers, would benefit all Americans. Cultural conflicts growing out of the rise of the evangelicals and later from increased immigration likewise spilled over into politics. These new political concerns cut across community lines and could not be contained by the old deferential politics. Instead, a new class of professional politicians epitomized by Martin Van Buren began to develop the modern mass political party. Operating at first in the states, they mobilized armies of local workers and voters to campaign for party control of government policy and patronage jobs. During the administration of President John Quincy Adams, increasing polarization between Adams' National Republican supporters and the Democratic Republicans, soon to be called Democratic supporters of Andrew Jackson, allowed Van Buren, a Jackson supporter, to extend his organization to the national level. The result was not only a victory for Jackson in the election of 1828, but also the first great national victory for the new mass electorate. So let's begin by looking at our very first section, which is the decline of the notables and the rise of parties. Expansion of the franchise, the right to vote, was the most dramatic expression of the democratic revolution. Beginning in the late 1810s, many states revised their constitutions to give the franchise to nearly every white male farmer and wage earner. In America's traditional agricultural society, wealthy notables dominated the political system and managed local elections by building up supporting factions. Now, smallholding farmers and ambitious laborers in the Midwest and in the Southwest launched the first challenges to the traditional political order. The constitutions of new states prescribed a broad male franchise and voters usually elected middling men to local and state offices. To deter the migration to these western states, the elites in most eastern legislatures grudgingly accepted a broader franchise for their own states. So now more men are voting. By the mid-1820s, only a few states, North Carolina, Virginia, and Rhode Island, 
required the ownership of freehold property for voting. Between 1818 and 1821, some eastern states reapportioned legislatures on the basis of population and instituted more democratic forms of local government, so more and more Americans are becoming involved. Americans began then to turn to government in order to advance business, religious, and cultural causes. As the power of the notables declined, the political party emerged as the organizing force in the American system of government. Parties were political machines that gathered the diverse agenda of social and economic groups into a coherent legislative program. Between 1817 and 1821, Martin Van Buren created the first statewide political machine, and he later organized the first nationwide political party called the Jacksonian Democrats. Keys to Van Buren's political successes were his systematic use of party newspapers to promote a platform and drum up the vote and his use of patronage. He and his party made 6,000 political appointments in New York. Van Buren then used the spoils system to award public jobs to political supporters after an electoral victory. Van Buren also insisted on party discipline and required state legislators to follow the dictates of a caucus or a meeting of party leaders. So let's take a closer look then at the election of 1824. With the, demo with the, with the democracy now forming in politics, the arist aristocratic Federalist Party virtually disappeared, uh, and the Republicans broke up into more competing factions. The election of 1824 had five candidates who all called themselves Republicans. John Quincy Adams, John C. Calhoun, William H. Crawford, Henry Clay, and Andrew Jackson. Congress selected William Crawford as the official candidate, yet the other candidates refused to accept the selection and sought support among ordinary voters. Although Jackson received nationwide support, no candidate received an absolute majority in the Electoral College. So members of the House of Representatives then had to choose the president. Clay assembled a coalition of congressmen that voted for Adams, and Adams repaid Clay by making him the Secretary of State. As a congressman, Clay had promoted the American system, an integrated program of national economic development. Now, Clay's appointment was a politically fatal mistake for both men. Calhoun accused Adams of using the power and patronage of, that, of, of the executive to thwart the political will. And Jacksonians in Congress condemned Clay for arranging what they called a corrupt bargain. So let's take a closer look now at the last notable president, John Quincy Adams. Adams embraced the American system proposed by Clay, uh, which was protective tariffs, federally subsidized transportation improvements, uh, and a national bank. Adams' policies favored the business elite of the Northeast and the entrepreneurs and commercial farmers in the Midwest, but won very little support among southern planters and small holding farmers. Uh, Congress approved only a few of Adams' proposals uh, for internal improvements, such as a short extension of the national road. The most far-reaching battle of the Adams administration came over tariffs. Uh, Adams' tariff of 1824 protected manufacturers in New England and Pennsylvania against imports of more expensive woolen and cotton textiles as well as iron goods. Disregarding Southern opposition, Northern Jacksonians joined with the supporters of Adams and Clay to enact the Tariff of 1828, which raised duties on raw materials, textiles, and, again, iron goods. The new tariff enraged the South. As the world's cheapest producer of raw cotton, the tariff cost Southern planters about $100 million a year as planters had to buy either higher cost American textiles and iron goods or highly taxed British goods. Southerners felt that the tariff was legalized pillage and labeled it a tariff of abominations. Our next section then is the democracy. 
and the election of 1828. Southerners refused to support Adams' bid for a second term. Uh, most were offended that he supported the land rights of Indians and blamed him for the new tariff. Uh, Adams' primary weakness was his increasingly out-of-date political style. Uh, for example, he felt that the country should ask for his services. Martin Van Buren and the professional politicians handling Andrew Jackson's campaign had no reservations about running for the presidency, meaning asking the people to be the president, uh, which is a big difference from Adams. Jacksonians initially called themselves Democratic Republicans, but eventually became simply Democrats. And their name conveyed their message that through them, the middling majority, the democracy, would rule. Jackson's appeal as a candidate was his message of equal rights and, again, popular rule. His hostility to business corporations and to Clay's American system, his hatred, really, towards Native Americans, uh, and his personal preference for a judicious tariff all helped him. Uh, Jackson received 178 of 261 electoral votes and became the first president from a western state. However, the massive outpouring of popular support for Jackson frightened men of wealth and of influence. Okay, this does conclude our video lecture for today, uh, The Rise of Popular Politics. Please take a look at the review questions at this time and continue on with your work.